Hi, welcome to the Indian Trade Shop at Fort Vancouver. My name is Pat Barry, and I'm a volunteer here. I'm a retired federal park ranger, and after 35 years of doing a lot of paperwork and computer stuff, I get to do the fun part of the job now. So I'm going to tell you about the trade shop. Uh, this is where you would come if you re if you brought furs to Fort Vancouver. This is where you could get trade goods, and these trade goods came from all over the world. For example, if you look over here, we had wool blankets from England. You could trade for these Hudson's Bay blankets. And in case you don't know, they're marked by points. So the points tell you the size of the blanket. So for example, a two-point blanket, which is worth about seven-eighths of a beaver, is smaller than a three-point blanket, which would be worth about two beavers. You could also get four-point blankets. Uh, you could get linen from Ireland, silk from China, cotton from both India and Europe. You could get ready-made European clothing, things like tobacco, thimbles, beads, buttons, soap for those infrequent baths. You could get spode china from England. You could get all kinds of things. So we have pretty much what's on display here is what you could have gotten in 1845. Now, how do we know? So the reason we know what was here is because we have written records and we have archeological evidence. So a written record, for example, we have a ledger over here. If I did a transaction as a clerk for the Hudson's Bay Company, I would take my quill pen and dip it in some ink and record the transaction. I traded a blanket for fur or whatever. So we have written records. We also had archeological evidence, and let me tell you a fun story. You see, we have beads on strings here, but the beads were actually sold in bulk. And I would go back here and scoop some beads into my little container here and weigh it on the scale. And when we agree to a price, I would transfer them from my container into somebody's container, and I might accidentally drop a few beads on the floor. And apparently the boards were not as tight together back then as they are now, so some beads fell through the cracks. Well, you know, the fort burned down in 1866, and the ground was used for many things over the years. There was a polo field, there was a part of a uh, a spruce mill back during World War I. But when it was time to make this into a reconstructed fort, in time for the American Bicentennial, archaeologists went to work digging in the ground. And when they dug here, they not only found beads, they found beads in straight rows where they had fallen through the cracks. So that's another way we know what was here. This is a National Historic Site but it's also an archaeological site. We have PhDs in archaeology working here. And they work today in cooperation with university groups. So the university needs some research project, let's say from uh, Washington State University or Portland State University. They'll come here and their project will be supervised by a PhD in archaeology who works here for the National Park Service. So the Park Service, which always needs the money, gets free labor, and the university, which always needs projects, can come here and do a, a, a real archaeological dig. Now, uh, when they did their research on the beads, they found that most of the beads came from the part of the world around Italy. The glass beads are very popular trade items. So we have all the trade items that they could make here. Now, it's kind of funny because we could make things like an axe here, but we couldn't make the file. The file had to come from a factory in England. And we couldn't make things like spode, which is a uh, British pottery. So it's kind of a fun story. I ask people today, if you order something, how long does it take to get to your home? And they say, two days. But back in those days, they had to wait two years. Because when the trade ship arrived, which was about once a year, they would load 60,000 furs. The ship would go down the coast. Couldn't go through the Panama Canal, of course, because it wasn't built until 1912. Went around the tip of South America, all the way over to England. That trip took six to nine months. Then they would unload 60,000 furs and load up trade goods and maybe some food supplies that could not be grown here. The ship would come back around, maybe stop in the, what they call the Sandwich Islands, we call Hawaii today, and then come back to here. So you're looking at two years rather than two months. So it was a long journey, and of course, life was different. And it's not that long ago. We're only talking about 170 years ago, roughly. And that's, I guess, my great-great-grandfather would have been alive back then.
And of course, the world was different. We're in the wilderness. This is really the only European outpost around here. So one big obstacle they had to overcome was how do we communicate? So working for the Hudson's Bay Company as a clerk, I would speak English. But the people who walk through the front door might speak Hawaiian, they might speak French, they might speak a tribal language. So they communicated using a tribal language or a kind of a hybrid language called Chinook jargon or Chinook Wawa. It was their, it was their trade language. So you could get the point across, I want to trade this. You might say hoi hoi for trade. Uh, you might say um, uh, kamusak, I believe is what for, the word for beads. So you could, or maybe that's blankets, I can, or la pipe for the, for the pipe. So that would be how you communicate. You'd all have these common words that you could use. Now speaking of la pipe, there's another good archeologist story that goes with this. Today we know that tobacco clogs our lungs, but it also clogs pipes. So what they would do is, I'd be trading with someone in here. There'd be people waiting outside, smoking la pipe, smoking maybe some tobacco. When the pipe clogged, very often what they would do is snap off the end, throw it onto the ground. The archeologists found lots of pipe tips around here. It's kind of like the cigarette butt of the 1840s, all over the place. The other things that they found of interest, thimbles. Everybody who sews knows about thimbles, but many of the thimbles that they found here had holes cut in them. And the idea is maybe people wore them as decoration around their neck, on their costumes or something like that. So looking good was important just like it is today. Uh, they, over here we have a, a garment made of a, uh, made of a Hudson's Bay blanket. You see it's a four point blanket. They used antlers for the buttons. And we're here in the Pacific Northwest so it has a hoodie. This is called a capote. That's the, the name given to these. So. Lots of things, you know, maybe look familiar, but of course life was very different. No electricity, of course. Um, they had to use candles to light the way at night. They used fire starting kits using flint and steel. And I'm terrible at this, but I'll try it. You take a piece of steel, something flammable, you make a spark like that, and you start your fire. And on a sunny day, you could use the magnifying glass and the lid to maybe start a fire that way. So. They were very resourceful. Of course, you depended on fire because there was no electricity, at least not for another 50 years or so, if you were wealthy, right? So life was different. So that kind of gives you an idea of some of the things that were traded here. Pretty much whatever you needed, and if you didn't have what you needed here, you could get something here and maybe go up to Salilo Falls and trade for some obsidian, or go out to the coast and trade for some dentalia shells, or whatever it is you were looking for, you could get something here at least and go trade. So that was really the way the economy worked. And the British just kind of came into an existing tribal trading system and made it work. So that's how it worked. And of course, things changed dramatically when the, when the American soldiers got here, but that's another story. So thanks very much.